do want to thank you all for being here. We, we appreciate your support of our library and our programs, both in your active participation at nights like this and also your generous donations. And I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, it's been revamped. It goes out about once a month. And um, uh, you won't miss any other programs coming up. So tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Laura Waterman to speak about her brand new book of personal essays, Calling Wild Places Home. Laura grew up in New Jersey and was working in New York City as a book editor, which is appropriate here in the library, um, when she discovered the joys of climbing and she met Guy Waterman. And in 1973, they moved to Corinth, Vermont to establish an off-the-grid homestead. And over the next three decades, until Guy's death in 2000, um, they collaboratively wrote books about mountaineering and ethics and stewardship and um, uh, subjects and issues that grow out of their own climbing life. Uh, Laura and um, posthumously Guy were awarded the David Brower Conservation Award from the American Alpine Club. And um, in 2019, Laura was inducted into the AAC's Hall of Mount Mountaineering Excellence. Um, I first met Laura when she published Losing the Garden, the story of a marriage in 2005 which is a memoir about their homesteading, writing, and climbing years, and her attempt to understand her own role in her husband's decision to take his own life. Calling the Wild Places Home is a further exploration of, exploration of this difficult time, along with reflections on aging and family. And Laura will be talking this evening with um, Mary Margaret Sloan, who, I'm happy to say, is currently a volunteer substitute, substitute librarian here at the library. I first met Mary Margaret when she was the executive director of Vital Communities, mm -hmm. uh, one of the many positions she's held, along with the Student Conservation Association, the American Hiking Society, and the Children's Literacy Foundation, to name just a few. Um, and these, all these organizations further her goals of community service and stewardship of the earth. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Mary Margaret. Thank you so much. Um, wow, this is great. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, so uh, I'm Mary Margaret, and I'll be interviewing Laura tonight. Um, <clears throat> well, I I'll ask her a series of questions, and then at the end, you know, we'll open it up, and you all have a chance to ask her some questions as well, and engage her in a dialogue. Um, so um, <clears throat> Laura's had many adventures in her life. Um, Liza alluded to some of them. Um, you know, she helped. Um, with Guy Spawn, the wilderness ethics movement, um, fully off-grid homesteader. Um, in Losing the Garden, she provided an unflinching reflection on her husband's <coughs> um, death by suicide. And um, she's also, uh, as Liza mentioned, you know, pretty pretty badass uh, climber. <laughs> she, <laughs> um, one of the stories that I read uh, is that, uh, well, Laura um, did a first ascent, winter ascent, uh, ice climb, of this climb called the Black Dyke, which um, Avon Schnard, who's the founder of Patagonia, said it could not be climbed. And he described it as a black, filthy, horrendous icicle. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, but I met Laura after all of these things. Um, um, I, um, I, I met her um, in 2005. And so I know her as um, a woman committed through and through to the land um, and stewardship of the land um, through uh, her organization, the Waterman Fund, um, and um, someone who is unfailingly cheerful unless you call her when she's listening to the opera <laughs> on the radio. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, and, um, and she's someone who's um, continuously challenging herself, you know, writing books and essays, you know, well into her 80s. And, um, you know, she's a real hero of mine. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, all right. So um, these questions um, I uh, drafted um, with another mutual friend of ours, and Laura's seen them. So um, just so you know how this will work. <clears throat> so Laura, <clears throat> when you and Guy decided to homestead, you were young. It was the early 70s, and you two were in this adventure together. One of my favorite stories is how you knew you wanted to grow or cultivate everything you ate 
which meant giving up meat. At the time, most everyone ate meat at every meal. Um, and you started your transition by giving up meat for breakfast and gradually worked your way to a fully vegetarian diet. The other parts of your transition were more abrupt. No electricity, no indoor plumbing. But since you were used to hiking and climbing and sleeping in a tent, maybe that didn't seem as much of a shock. Then after about 25 years after Guy died, you had to transition back to a more mainstream lifestyle. How did that feel to move from the 19th to the 21st century? Um, and can you start by reading from your essay titled Light in a Cabin? Good question, Mary Margaret. <laughs> And you're right about um, um, that it wasn't really very hard because of all the camping and hiking we had done. And um, we basically were building our house and living in our tent on the property. So by the time we finally were able to move into the house, um, it didn't feel very primitive. So. In June 2000, when I moved from our homestead a distance of two miles, wait a minute, yeah. That's right. 170. Yeah, I'm on the right page. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, in June 2000, when I moved from our homestead a distance of two miles to the house where I have lived ever since, I was not expecting the reaction this relocation provoked in my friends who were quite aware of the, jump, of the jump across centuries that it entailed. At Barra, we had built a small room for washing up using a pitcher and basin. We located the outhouse, a short walk uphill, perhaps 50 paces from the cabin. In the summer, we took daily baths in the bathhouse we constructed by our stream. In winter, we used a small cattle trough for a tub. This sounds primitive and inconvenient, but it worked very well for us. I had moved to this house with its bathroom, a sink, shower, indoor toilet that flushes. I had moved as well from kerosene and candle light to electricity. I moved from, from heat entirely generated by a wood stove, still a wood stove, but also the option of propane. I moved from carrying water from our stream uphill to our house for drinking and cooking to turning on the hot or cold water taps. No need now to boil water for washing dishes or doing laundry. I moved from doing our laundry by hand to a washer dryer in the basement. I moved from a root cellar to a refrigerator. But a root cellar is so useful for storing winter crops that I had one built into the basement of my new home. I moved from using no power tools to working up the eight cords of wood we needed each year for cooking and heating and our maple syrup operation to having the two or three cords of wood I needed delivered already cut and split. My job now was reduced to stacking. If a chunk was too big for my stove, I used the maul and wedges to trim the log. I had moved from a sort of isolation that could have us walking up to a mile and a half to reach our house 
to a place that demanded no walk at all. We'd had a car at Barra. We never figured out a way to do without it. But we closed off our road, impossible to keep open in winter anyway, and left the car in a variety of spots along the walk to our house, depending on the condition of the road itself. It was dirt with several hills, including a long, challenging one that needed a rolling start to get up. We had established water bars, drainage ditches, and kept them scraped out. We made a practice of not driving on the road if we might cause ruts or damage the road surface, surface after heavy rains. Most important was not to drive on the road until it had completely thawed out after spring mud season. That's why we had the intermediate parking spots. We took a fair amount of satisfaction of maintaining our road in a way that embraced the notion of restraint. Aside from this, our car, that hunk of metal, in our eyes, offended the beauty of our clearing. The car did not fit in. Did you want to add anything else, or do you want me to? Uh, do I want to add <laughs> anything else? Well, I'm sure it sounds extremely primitive and uncomfortable, but it really wasn't at all. I would say the hardest adjustment to where I'm living at present um, is electricity in the sense that when we turn on the light, the electricity works to actually cut, cut you off from what's going on outside. And we could be at our table at Barra reading with um, the kerosene lamp, and we were able to look out and see the stars and the moon. And, and continue to read. But you can't do that with electricity. And I still miss that aspect of um, what we had at Barron. <clears throat> your husband, Guy, died by suicide, which you explored in your earlier book, Losing the Garden. In February 2000, as he was leaving for Mount Lafayette in the Franconia Ridge where the two of you had stewarded trails for 18 years, he left you a note which read in part, one part of me will never leave one part of you, but you will also build your own life from now on. Can you talk about how it feels to have built this chapter of your life without Guy? Since his death, you've written books, essays, and launched an impactful nonprofit called the Waterman Fund which protects high alpine areas in the Northeast. How it feels. Um, <clears throat> well, I can say that that note that Guy left for me was extremely helpful. I mean, basically he was saying, to live your life, and I'm, I knew that he, um, he was very clear that he wanted to take his own life. And I was actually very fortunate that he chose to share that with me instead of just walking out the door, which I should add, he actually tried to do, but he came back, came back from Cannon. Uh, he didn't jump off Cannon Cliff, which was his plan, and basically, that gave us 18 months together. And it was based a process of saying goodbye to um, the seasons. I mean, um, planting the garden, harvesting, or before that, sugaring, collecting wood, all of that. It gave us a chance to do it together 
And um, that also, I think, made a big difference in allowing me to continue on. So um, starting the Waterman Fund also um, makes me, we're doing what we wrote about and practiced. And that was started by very dear friends. Mary Margaret was on our board. Were you president? I was president. Dennis was on. Is JT on? Yeah, there are a number of people here. Yeah. Um, so, um, have I answered the question? Yes. <laughs> um. <clears throat> Although I never met Guy, I understand him to have been an amazing personality. He was a speechwriter for Eisenhower, Nixon, and Ford, and he was talented enough. He might have had a career in jazz piano. <clears throat> in fact, before you close the road, Tabera, you and several Burley friends managed to get his Steinway grand piano to your cabin. <clears throat> he often, uh, Guy often compared himself to Caliban and Ariel, which is from Shakespeare's The Tempest. And he, f <clears throat> and he felt represented his own highs and lows, while you call yourself Piglet to Guy's Christopher Robin. <clears throat> You said, how I acted toward Guy was very much a part of who I am, a supportive person who does well being mentored by a strong and trustworthy leader. You use the present tense, this is who I am, but how do you reconcile that with who you are today, You know, almost 25 years after Guy's death, and all that you've done since then with courage? You know, it was very interesting that um you picked up on the piglet <laughs> because um, I had not basically intended that guy be a part of this book. Um, when my agent suggested it, he said, uh, he, didn't, he said in effect, this could be easy because you already have enough material from past magazine articles. And, um, and we had talked about things that interested me to write about. So like my family and my dad, who was a writer and a scholar, and um, I was, what kind of role model he was for me. I wanted to write about books, reading, libraries. Um, so, um, and I didn't really see Guy as being a big part of the story. So I was a good, easily halfway into it before. Basically, I saw that he couldn't be left out. And, um, but then I was actually to the, you're very near the end of the book before I realized I practically, saw myself as Piglet as I was writing that sentence. And so, of course, if I was Piglet, what was Guy? <laughs> and I think that I saw him as a mixture of Pooh, but basically as Christopher Robin. Because when you think about it, Christopher Robin goes off, he grows up, and he left. And Piglet and Pooh are left to find comfort or whatever. They had their homes in the Hundred Acre Wood, and they could continue on perfectly well, and as I feel I have myself. I just want to add that um, I really enjoy being a piglet. <laughs> <laughs> it 
it seems as though your approach to wildness and how to protect it comes from your experience with the sudden countrywide change that rock climbers made in the 70s, from hammering pitons into rocks to using tools that were not destructive and left little trace. The thinking being, if the whole climbing community could do it, why not everybody else? Now, the Cog Railway plans to build a luxury hotel near the top of Mount Washington, bringing in more people, <clears throat> tramping more plants, and affecting wildness. How do you keep your hopes and optimism up with things like this looming over you and Guy's work, both as stewards of places like Franconia Ridge and as wilderness ethics advocates through your books? Good question. Um, I think, I mean, you have to keep your hopes up because you just have no choice. But I think of David Brower, who, um, you know, was a role model for any conservationist. And he pushed very hard, I mean, to the point of making enemies, even among his friends. And um, I think, so I, when I'm feeling discouraged, and believe me, the Cog Railway is an extremely, you know, it's horrendous, hideous, couldn't be worse idea. It would definitely damage those plants. But yet, I mean, even if it's erected, if, even if it comes to pass, we can't give up hope. There's no point in it. <clears throat> you and Guy embraced a strong connection to nature, both in your off-grid life at Vera and in your advocacy for wildness. It seemed like you tried not to be preachy or get angry. Instead, you encouraged people to learn and think and have fun at the same time. Can you read from your essay of Time and Mountains? So that's page 110. Can you do that? I'm going to adjust your mic a little bit so maybe we can hear a little better. Mm -hmm. OK, try that. Thanks. OK. 110. Page 110, yeah. Basically, Guy and I wanted to present the other side of an argument going around in the late 1960s, early 1970s, that people should get away from time when they went to the woods. Leave the watches at home, the argument went, because here was a chance to be spontaneous a word carried over from those years, and turn our backs on the time pressures and clock watching of the workday life. Thinking about this caused us to ask ourselves a question. How do we want to relate to time when we go to the mountains? It seemed to us that how we kept track of time affects our relationship to the land, to wildness itself. Isn't this a worthwhile question to ask ourselves again with each generation that looks to wild places? Certainly, those who came of age in the horse and buggy days had a different relationship to time than did the 1960s generation that grew up with traffic jams, television, transistor radios, and the telephone. In the 1980s and 90s generation, they grew up with internet access, iPods, cell phones, text messaging, and ever speedier highway systems leading to the mountains. Back in the 1970s, when Guy and I wrote that piece in New England Outdoors, we understood how a timeless Edenic innocence could be an appealing notion if, on the job, you felt beaten down by the daily grind. But it made no sense to us why anyone would want to actually get away from time. 
when on weekends in the mountains. On our hiking trips, there always seemed to be many good reasons to know what time it was. How soon should we start making camp if we didn't want to be cleaning up from dinner in the turf? Have we got time to take that side trip over to another summit? How can we be sure to get up early enough to be on the trail at first light so we, don't, so we can be above tree line to watch the sunrise? In winter, days are short then. When, could we, when should we set our turnaround time as to have the steepest part of the descent or that dicey stream crossing behind us in daylight? All these seems like practical situations and goals we would need to, a clock for, but as it evolved, neither of us wanted to keep track of time by wearing a, a watch. I wore a watch during the week. We were working in New York City at the time and kept it stuffed in my pocket on weekends. Was it that wearing a watch in the mountains pushed time front and center in our faces, whether this was so or not, Guy tended to break watches. One was ripped from his wrist by a stub of a stunted spruce as he glided down a steep snow slope on Mount Clay. Another suffered a smashed crystal in a climbing fall at the Shawangungs, keeping track of time in the mountains for Guy was going to be expensive, but <laughs> then he'd always been hard on equipment. After fooling around with pocket watches, he kept losing. Guy finally decided on an alarm clock that pushed, that purchased, I'm sorry, on an alarm clock and purchased a large, round, white-faced kind they sold in the dime store. Later, after the clock malfunctioned on a winter hiking trip, and we slept through an intended pre-dawn start to awaken in a sun-drenched tent, he bought a second clock as a backup. In winter, with those short daylight hours, it was even more essential to keep track of the time, so Guy carried both clocks in a shirt to keep their work from stalling out in the cold. At night, he slept with them in a sleeping bag. Eccentric? Well, sure. And it was a practical solution that worked for him, and he had no trouble working with such eccentricities into his personal style. For instance, if a hiker stopped to ask us the time, Guy would obligingly dig a hand into a shirt and haul out the dime store clock. <laughs> this, in the midst of the snowy woods in January, miles from the nearest highway, the hiker would take a step back. Guy, eager to provide the questioner with more assurance, would rummage around in his shirt again and produce, with an image grin, the second large white-faced <laughs> clock. Um, so do you, can you talk a little bit about um, what wildness means to you and how you feel your gentle and sometimes irreverent approach has worked? Oh, that's a big question. That's a big question. <laughs> um, I think what we meant by uh, talking about the spirit of wildness was thinking about reverence, awe, um, um, we didn't connect it with religion, I'm sure you could, but we didn't. But uh, I think that love fits in there. 
Um, and the more that, I mean, for us at any rate, working on the Frank County Ridge for 18 years and becoming acquainted with um, the trail up there, becoming acquainted with the um, old bridle path that leads up to Greenlee Top, that leads up to the summit. We, and then making a circuit across the ridge, two miles over Lafayette, Lincoln, our first, um, what we call Truman, which was a little bump in between Lafayette and Lincoln, and Little Haystack. And you can feel you've already lost a couple of hundred feet from uh, Lafayette at that point. Going down the stony, steep, knee, breaking, <laughs> falling waters trail. But we got to know it so well. We could have, it didn't matter how often you did that walk because you were seeing something new every time. I think that speaks to the spirit of wildness also. In your essay, Seeking an Ethic of Restraint, you bemoan the overcrowding at Franconia Ridge. Mm -hmm. It's disappointing for you to go now and see the parking lot overflowing and cars parked for a half mile along the road. Especially during the pandemic, overcrowding caused people to push outside the trail itself, create basically a second trail paralleling the first, with hikers unknowingly walking all over the rare and threatened tundra looking for views and good lunch spots. But isn't it a good thing that more people are out enjoying nature? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course it is. Um, but I think um, there's definitely a learning curve uh, for all of us when we went to the mountains for the first time. Um, to go back a number of years, a lot of years, to the 1930s. Guy's father took his sons um, on canoeing trips in the Allagash. And since he was a physics professor at Yale, he had probably about three months off in the summer. So they made very long trips, and they were basically alone up there. And they were able to start fires, I mean, cook over them. They were able to chop down boughs from spruce or fir trees for comfortable sleeping, spreading out their sleeping bags. And so then, um, a guy actually missed out on most of those trips because he was too young. And, but his older brothers, when they read, who had gone on those trips with their father, when they read about what we were talking about in backwards ethics in particular, not chopping baths, not building fires for using a stove, not washing in streams, your dishes, and um, they actually were, I think, quite offended because we were being critical of something that meant a very great deal to them. So, um, by the time of the pandemic, so I think what I'm getting at is that we are, we're all beginners, and basically we inherit a, a certain way of behaving in the woods. And, um, and that continues to change. And what forces change, I think, is numbers of people coming to the mountains. And the pandemic certainly brought that out 
and a difficulty in many areas, the Brown County Ridge being an important area, is that that is a very narrow ridge, and there's not the trail is not really constructed for people to be passing. Um, I mean, you have to walk off the trail sometimes to be able to pass people. So, but it's very difficult to, um, to learn that the plans shouldn't be stopped on. I mean, I think most people going up there for the first time don't really see uh, the plans. I mean, they grow so close to the ground. So while it's good that people are coming to the mountains, um, there's a learning curve. And I know that the clubs certainly try to keep abreast of the way we need to behave in the mountains now. And, but you can do it for a friend. I mean, it can happen at really any level. Um, and I think we'll probably continue to keep learning because that's just, I think, the way things work. Okay, so this is the last question, and then we'll open it up um, for anyone who wants to ask Laura um, about any of her stories. Um, in your essay, The Ascent at 80, you say your takeaway from climbing is, quote, something about seizing opportunities, trusting yourself, saying yes to just about everything, but not forgetting that good judgment remains an essential part of the equation, too. Can you read a bit from this essay and share what you're saying yes to now? So this is page 270. My work on Franconia Ridge had ended several years before Guy's death in 2000. I was sidelined by falling knees, a common complaint among hikers, backpackers, and trail workers who often carry heavy loads up and down steep and rugged trails. Our descent paths off the ridge, the Bali Waters Trail, was renowned for being a knee destroyer. <laughs> After I had double knee replacements in 2004, I returned to the ridge a few times with my over 60-year-old hiking friends. We were slow. I was aware of just how slow when I remembered how rapidly Guy and I could traverse the ridge while putting a full day of work. When I thought about gnats, recent invitation, or rather, my too eager expression of a wish to see his work and that of his young crew, I picture myself at the end of a line, puffing hard to keep up. They would stop and wait for me and be polite about it. But it, did I want that? The effort to push uphill had always been a pressure for me. It takes a mental tweak to get into that space of enjoying a certain amount of sucking air, and I could still do it. But now, only at the pace of someone well past 70. With Matt and his college-age crew, golly, I realized I'd feel a certain embarrassment. I just wasn't the hiker I had been, and I didn't feel like placing myself at that disadvantage. The best way, of course, to take the time, indeed needed on the ridge, to see their work would have been to stay overnight at Greenleaf Hut. Nat offered to arrange this. Then it struck me that I didn't want to. Returning to Greenleaf was too much like returning to your childhood home, not visited in the intervening years. As a grown-up adult, I remember being with my mother 
when that happened to her. She had taken my brother and me to visit her side of the family. When we walked into the house where she had grown up, she gave a throaty gasp and put her hand to her chest. I looked up at her face with concerned alarm. She pulled herself together, but I have never, for, I have never forgotten her words. It's all changed. Where is? What happened to? So as much as I would have loved to have seen Nat's work, he had often described to me his own ever-evolving process of care for the ridge, more heavily trampled than ever. I said no to a return to the ridge in Green Lake Pot. I felt, in consequence, a good deal of relief. At this stage of the game, I was just glad to be hiking at all. If you can't recreate the past, let it go and concentrate on what's happening next. As Piglet said to Pooh, I say, I wonder what's going to happen exciting today. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're saying yes? Saying yes to I you. said no to the Franconia Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, a friend of mine, an older friend, who had lost his wife and found that he missed that her very much, said, I'm just saying yes to everything. And somehow, that stuck in my head. And um, so I started saying yes to everything, too, <laughs> but in a controlled sort of way. And um, I think what it, what it means for me is doing what I like doing, which um, basically is walking, hiking, um, an occasional non 4,000 foot mountain. I can still, I celebrated my birthday, 84th, um, on a spur, it was a spur trail in the Kinsman Range called Ball Top, I'm sure many of you have been up. So, you know, um, often I'm thinking, Maybe it's too hard, but you know, it really isn't um, if you get into the spirit of going up, you just keep placing one foot in front of the other. So I'm sure you, most of you, many of you here know what I'm talking about. That's great. <clears throat> 